Welcome to the Supporting the Developer Ecosystem track. Thanks to millions of open source developer hours committed over Bitcoin's 12 year history and a burgeoning and supportive ecosystem, Bitcoin is no longer an obscure cryptographic toy. It's an open source financial network that secures hundreds of billions of dollars of value in a global, permissionless and decentralized way. Yet as a common good, there is no one single Bitcoin protector or guardian. There's no leader or manager. By design, there's no central command. And while this presents significant logistical challenges, it's also the distinguishing feature perhaps most unique to Bitcoin. That said, a lack of central organization doesn't mean there isn't a need for thoughtful focus and coordination to continually support the development of the network. Today, Bitcoin is supported by a very passionate group of volunteer developers and distributed organizations but its long-term success requires a sustainable funding model. In this track, we're going to hear from open source Bitcoin developers and individuals and initiatives who are contributing to the developer ecosystem. Hello, my name is John Newbery. I'm a Bitcoin protocol engineer and the founder and executive director of Brink, a nonprofit that supports open source Bitcoin development. Today, I'm going to talk about Bitcoin as open source money and more generally how that fits into a wider historic context of free and open source software. The Bitcoin network is developed and maintained by a decentralized group of contributors and that open source ethos of Bitcoin is essential to its decentralization, to its censorship resistance, and to its neutrality as money. So we'll find out how. Before that, a little bit of context on free and open source software. So free software, um, well, in English, we have different meanings of the word free, um, but free software is generally considered to mean free like speech. You have certain rights around the software. And unlike proprietary software, um, those rights are that you can run the software for any purpose that you want. You can download and view the source code that makes that software. You can make modifications to it and potentially contribute those modifications back to the project to improve it. And you can redistribute that, pro that software however you see fit. Now, that's very unlike proprietary software, so Microsoft Word or Mac OS where you certainly can't run it for any purpose you want. You're bound by the license that you own on it. You can't view the source code, you can't modify it, and you certainly can't redistribute it. Um, proprietary software is like buying a car where the hood is welded shut. If there's something wrong with the engine, you have no option to open and tinker around. You have to take it back to the shop where you bought it. And what that means in terms of the development and maintenance of open source software is that it's maintained by the public. Um, there's no proprietary, there's no intellectual property moat around it. No one can, can make money off it by selling licenses in that way. There certainly have been successful businesses with open source software, um, but the way that it's developed is very different from that proprietary software. So a very short history of, of free and open source software. Um, well, there's been free software since people started writing software, but the modern free software movement um, can trace itself back to the mid 80s, the GNU project coming out of MIT and the Free Software Foundation started in 1985. Um, fast forward a few years and Linux was created by Linus Torvalds um, and that attempted to be a Unix-like operating system. Linux is the kernel and then the applications, the, the user applications on top of that is the GNU project. And so together they, they create this operating system and even if you don't use Linux on your laptop or your desktop, um, you, you use Linux every single day because the vast majority of web servers use Linux. Um, the Android phone in your pocket, if you have an Android, is based on Linux. Um, if you're NASA and you're flying a helicopter on Mars, that runs on Linux. It's been a phenomenally successful project, and it is developed and maintained um, by, by volunteers, by contributors who don't get paid directly by Linux. Um, in 1998, the Netscape browser was made open source, and this is when 
um, open source as a term first was coined, um, so free and open source software. And then in 2005, Git uh, was developed, and Git is a distributed and decentralized source version control system. Um, and in 2008, GitHub was launched, let's say, a web service that, that uses Git and is where many open source projects are now hosted, including Bitcoin Core. Um, so this is a kind of a bit of historic context. And Satoshi would have been, been very aware of all of this when, when Satoshi created Bitcoin um, and also would have been aware of the many previous attempts to make private money, which generally failed because of centralization, because there was a single point that could be shut down. And so for a money, a neutral free money, private money to be successful, Satoshi knew it needed, be, needed to be decentralized. And part of that is that it's open source. Anyone can view the code. They don't have to trust. They can verify themselves. And there's not a single point of failure that can be shut down. So what we know, Satoshi probably started working on Bitcoin in 2007. We don't know for sure because we don't know who Satoshi is. But from um, the writings on the, the mailing list and emails, we know that Satoshi was working on Bitcoin for um, 18 months, two years before um, it was announced on that mailing list. And then in, in October 2008, it was announced, the first uh, public announcement of Bitcoin, shortly followed in January 2009 by the software. And it was open source. Anyone could look at that code and they could make modifications if they wanted. Um, and it didn't take long, it took less than a year before the first new contributor showed up. Um, and then a, a bit later, or over the next year or so, 18 months, 2009 through 2010, there are various releases, a lot of bug fixes, a lot of changes um, until just December 2010. So a little bit over a year after that first release of the software, Satoshi's last post appeared on the mailing list and Satoshi was not seen again in public. Um, so that's where uh, Bitcoin came from. And then since then, the project has just continued to grow. Um, in December 2010, Satoshi disappeared and Gavin Andreessen became the maintainer. So there was someone to pass that baton on to. Um, also in De December 2010, development moved from SourceForge, where it was being hosted before, to GitHub. And like I said, GitHub is a, a very popular website for hosting open source projects. Um, many thousands of projects, many millions of projects are hosted there, hundreds of thousands of developers. And that's where GitHub, sorry, Bitcoin Core is hosted today. Um, in August 2011, the BIP process was formalized. Um, BIPs are Bitcoin improvement proposals, and they're the way that the protocol gets changed. So the most recent examples would be Schnorr Taproot and SegWit, which many of you might have heard of. Um, this is a way that the community can get together, discuss changes, formalize them, standardize them. Then in December 2013, Bitcoin, the project, the software project, was renamed to Bitcoin Core. And that established a, a difference between Bitcoin, the protocol. So that's the way that the different nodes speak to each other over the internet and Bitcoin Core, the software project. And then fast forward to 2021, where we are today, Bitcoin Core has six maintainers and over 800 people have made contributions to the code in that time. So that's quite a, quite a successful project. Um, it should be mentioned that until 2012, no one was paid to work on Bitcoin. 2012 was when the Bitcoin Foundation was established. I'll talk a bit more about that later. Um, but for, for many of those early years, um, those people were contributing their, their talent and their expertise free and were not getting compensated for it. All right, so in general, what, what is an open source project and what are the roles in it? Well, um, Bitcoin uses lots of very interesting technology and so when we're thinking about changes to Bitcoin, that starts with research. So people discussing, analyzing, um, talking about different proposals that can change, that we can use to change the Bitcoin protocol. Another very important role in an open source project is maintenance. So we have contributors who write code and, and test code and review code. The maintainers are the ones who have kind of stewardship of the project. I should mention they're not leaders, they, they follow consensus, but they have the responsibility of merging code and, and making sure that releases go out on time. We have documentation, that's vitally important for a, a complex project like Bitcoin, so people are actually able to use the software. We have translations, so people in different countries can use the software, who speak different languages. And of course, we have development. Um, so what is development? Well, it may surprise you to hear that the number one thing that developers do is not write code, it's reviewing and testing code. Bitcoin is a security critical application. 
And if there are bugs in the software, then people lose money. And if there are very serious bugs in the software, uh, then the whole economy could crash and, and there would be no more Bitcoin. So we take review and testing very, very seriously and spend most of our time on those activities. Um, we find and fix bugs, and it may surprise people to know that um, there are bugs in Bitcoin. There are many bugs, and we find bugs every month. Some are more serious, some are less serious, but it's a software project created by developers, and so there are bugs, and there always will be. We, we just hope we find them before the bad guys don't. Another critical part of the work of con contributing to Bitcoin Core um, is improving performance. So Bitcoin Core is a performance critical piece of software. Um, we have this data structure called the blockchain, which grows ever larger all the time. And if you want to be a full node on the Bitcoin network, you need to download and process all of that data, validate all the signatures and so on. And so if we're not continually improving performance, then it will become infeasible to sync a new node or to stay synchronized to the tip of the blockchain. So we always need to be improving performance. As well as finding and fixing bugs, we want to improve security. So we want to make sure that we don't introduce new bugs or there aren't new attacks that can be carried out against Bitcoin. Um, so we do things like testing, all different kinds of testing, fuzz testing, property-based testing, unit testing, functional testing. Um, but we also look very carefully at things like the build system and make sure that it's not possible to insert bugs by compromising compilers or the tool chain or, or things like that. Um, so that's a very active area of development and research. And of course, we add features. Um, so what kind of features do we have? Well, well, all kinds. Um, you may have heard that Bitcoin development is slow and boring. Um, I don't think it's slow. I certainly don't think it's boring. Um, we're careful, and so we, we don't rush into things, but there's always activity going on. And the, the most obvious example of a feature, a recent feature, is the Schnorr Taproot soft fork. That's a protocol change. Um, and there's, there are many presentations and videos and podcasts about the technical details of that if you, if you want to learn more. Um, but from a high level, Schnorr Taproot will make Bitcoin more scalable because um, a Schnorr Taproot output is cheaper to validate than a pre-taproot output. So we can have more of them in the blockchain. Um, it improves fungibility and privacy because outputs look the same as each other. That's really important for a, for a money. We want it to be fungible. So one coin is the same value as another coin. And there's all kinds of interesting functionality that can be built on top of it. So Schnorr Taproot will be activated in November, sometime around November 20th. Um, and then it's down to the wallet developers the service providers, the application developers to make use of all that really interesting functionality. So that's very visible. That's a very user visible change. Something that's maybe a bit less visible are the improvements in the peer-to-peer -peer network. Now the peer-to-peer -peer network, again, is, is crucial for Bitcoin's decentralization. Um, if we didn't have it, it wouldn't be a decentralized um, money. There would be a centralized server that could be shut down. So making sure that the P2P network continues to function properly is vitally important. And there's always lots of activity around improving it, thinking of researching different ways to improve it. Um, one example is increased connectivity. So making the graph um, denser without unduly increasing the resource consumption of that peer-to-peer -peer network. And that means it's more difficult for your node to be eclipsed or isolated from the rest of the network. If an adversary is able to do that, they could prevent you from seeing the blockchain, they could censor your transactions. They could do all kinds of things. Um, and then network privacy is another area of research where we don't want people to be able to identify the source of transactions. Um, and again, we have lots of small changes there and big changes, and it's, it's an area of constant research and development, and many more. Um, I should point out at this point that Bitcoin has bugs. You know, some people think that Bitcoin's finished, it's done. Uh, we just need to wait for hyper-Bitcoinization and and all will be good. But in fact, there are always bugs in software. Bitcoin is a piece of software created by developers, and there are bugs. Um, many classes of bugs, some are more serious, some are less serious. But some recent examples um, or categories of bugs, you, you could have bugs where a miner, a malicious miner, could create money out of thin air um, and therefore potentially inflate the supply of Bitcoin. There was such a bug in 2017, obviously, um, if, if that continued or if it was allowed to, to be ex exploited, Bitcoin as a monetary system uh, would lose a lot of value. And fortunately, that was caught and, and fixed before it was exploited. 
Another category of bugs might be denial of service bugs or remote crash bugs. Um, another category would be privacy compromises. So an adversary or spy being able to identify the source of a transaction. Um, and another category of bugs is transaction propagation interference. So censoring transactions, stopping people from getting their transactions to miners. We've seen examples of all of these. Um, they happen not all the time, but frequently enough that they need to be fixed and we need to have developers looking at the code, fixing those bugs. So I've been talking mostly about Bitcoin Core so far, which is the most important project in Bitcoin. Um, the name suggests it's at the core of the network. And if Bitcoin Core stopped working, then Bitcoin would stop working. So I, I think that's the most important project, but there are many, many other projects in this, this developer ecosystem. Um, and I'll give you some examples here. One is LibSecP. That is a cryptographic library that's used by Bitcoin Core for verifying and creating signatures. Um, it's used by other projects as well for verifying and creating signatures, but it's a small project. It's, it's developed and maintained by quite a small team of people, um, but it's crucial to, to Bitcoin Core and it's crucial to Bitcoin. So that's lower down in the software stack. It's a kind of a, a base library and then you have Bitcoin Core on top of it. And then maybe going up the stack a bit, you have applications that are built on top of Bitcoin. Um, and Lightning is an example. There are, there are various different Lightning implementations. There are four main Lightning implementations and, and several other smaller ones, but the, the main ones are C Lightning, Eclair, LND, and then Rust Lightning or, or the Lightning Developer Kit. Um, and those are all maintained and, and built and developed by different teams. And you have various wallets. So here we can see Green Wallet, Blue Wallet, Electrum. Those are all open source and have different people working on them. Umbral is a node in a box, essentially, where you can um, set up your Raspberry Pi or your, your server to install Bitcoin Core and various applications. And on top, again, an open source project that, that people are contributing to. The Bitcoin Dev Kit is a collection of tools and libraries for application developers to use to build their wallets and applications on Bitcoin Core. Again, open source. And BTC Pay Server is a, a payment processor. Again, an open source project. So there's a, there's a huge array of different projects in the Bitcoin space that are open source and people are contributing to um, free of charge. I'm going to switch back to Bitcoin Core now uh, and give you a few statistics. Um, so these graphs are all normalized with 2012 being set to one um, and, and various metrics. So if we look at this graph, we can see that between 2012 and, and 2020, the number of changes merged per year has roughly doubled, um, which is great. Um, but even better, the number of reviewers has gone up by over three times and the number of re review comments has gone up almost 5x. So we're seeing more activity, but crucially we're seeing um, more intense review and, and more scrutinization of those changes in the code. So that's all good. That seems like a good, healthy project. And then if I add just one more metric to this graph, which is the price, um, those other metrics are still on the graph. You, you just can't see them because they're so flat. The price since 2012 has gone up over 2,000 fold. Um, now, I'm not saying that we should have 2,000 times as many developers as, as in 2012, but we now have a trillion dollar network and I'd estimate around 20 to 30 developers working full time on Bitcoin Core. So I would argue that probably at this point, Bitcoin protocol development is underfunded compared to the value that it's protecting. That said, the development landscape or the funding landscape for developers um, is a lot better than it has been in the past. And there are many organizations and individuals who are supporting Bitcoin development. The first was the Bitcoin Foundation that was established in, in 2012. Um, and, and shortly thereafter, basically dissolved because of political issues. Um, it, it ran until around 2015. It was funding developers. I believe it still exists, but just no longer funds Bitcoin protocol development. Um, and the developers who are being funded by the Bitcoin Foundation, I think, found funding with MIT DCI, the Digital Currency Initiative at um, MIT. And they have been funding two or three Bitcoin core developers for about six years now. So they've, they've done a lot of work to support Bitcoin. In 2014, both Chaincode Labs and Blockstream were established. Chaincode is a non-commercial uh, private organization that funds Bitcoin developers. Blockstream is a commercial startup that um, nevertheless funded a lot of open source work in LibSecP, in Bitcoin Core, in C, in C Lightning and still funds a lot of that work, as does Chaincode. In 2019, Square Crypto started. Um, they've given out grants to many developers and designers and also have an in-house team of developers working mostly on Rust Lightning on the LDK. And then last year, 2020, Brink was established. 
and we are currently funding seven open source Bitcoin developers. As well as those organizations, um, we've seen several exchanges start funding Bitcoin developers, and that's great to see that they are supporting the underlying technology that makes their businesses possible. Zappo, OKCoin, BitMEX, and Gemini are amongst them, um, and it's great to see that. Okay, some challenges for those Bitcoin developers and the organizations funding them. Um, I think as, as we see Bitcoin grow, um, a crucial challenge will be identifying and attracting the very best talent to work on Bitcoin. Bitcoin development is hard. There's a lot of very difficult technology. It's a, it's a mix of cryptography, peer-to-peer -peer networking, security, all kinds of very difficult stuff. And you mix it all, to get it all together and you get Bitcoin. Um, and we want to find the very best talent in the work to work on Bitcoin. Sorry, the very best talent in the world to work on Bitcoin. Another challenge is educating and mentoring those new contributors. Um, like I said, it's a very steep learning curve. And it takes a long time to establish establish yourself as a Bitcoin protocol developer. Um, so that's a challenge. These developers are very talented and could probably go out and, and find very well compensated work in, in the private market um, if they chose to. And so retaining open source developers to continue working on Bitcoin and supporting them financially continues to be a challenge. And one new one that we've we started seeing recently is legal challenges. Um, Sadly, several of the Bitcoin protocol developers are currently being sued on spurious legal challenges, um, and that continues to be um, a thorn in the side, and we hope that they'll get the support they need to continue the work that they're doing. Okay, so that's um, highlighted some of the challenges. For the rest of the day, you're going to hear from people who are facing those challenges and, and finding solutions to them. Next up, you'll hear from John Pfeffer, um, who is an investor who's been supporting Bitcoin open source development for several years. And he'll talk about why he supports Bitcoin and how he thinks about that support. After that, you'll hear a solutions panel from several of the organizations who are supporting Bitcoin developers, um, how they've overcome those challenges and how they think about that. And finally, you'll hear about how you can get involved and help. Okay, thank you very much. Hi there, I'm Peter McCormack. I am the host of the What Bitcoin Did, a podcast. I am here to uh, interview my good friend, John Pfeffer, uh, covering the second session of the, uh, supporting the developer ecosystem landscape. How are you doing, John? I'm wonderful. How are you? 
Feeling better? I'm good, buddy. Good. Yeah, feeling a lot better. Back's fixed, ready to talk to you. Everything's good, uh, ready to do this. And do you know, I've known you for probably three to four years now. Uh, and one of the things I didn't realize about you straight away was how much support you actually give to the developer landscape to be begin with. And that became more obvious later on as I got to, to know you more. Um, and I just think it'd be a really interesting place for people to start is for you to talk about your background and interest and your investing thesis, but why with Bitcoin that has given you this imperative to support the developers? So, I, you know, I, I'm an entrepreneur and I, and I have built different businesses in different industries. And as the years, decades have gone on, we um, also as a family are more and more active investing across all kinds of risk assets um, globally. And when we first encountered, well, Let's say the first, first encounter with Bitcoin was um, 2011, and frankly, it was it was just a little bit um, too hard for folks like us, I think, to get our heads around. But we had I had the good fortune of having coffee with my friend Vences Casares in 2016, and he explained Bitcoin to me in very simple terms that I understood. Um, it reminded me of um, of all of our venture investments, which are, you know, at the time look. Um, money is is a ledger for keeping up with what we owe each with what we owe each other. Um, Bitcoin is a better technology for that ledger. It'll probably fail, but if it works, it'll be very valuable. And I said, well, that sounds like all the other venture investments we make. And that framework was enough for me to say, well, we're going to make an allocation and we'll figure it out as we go. And I've talked about it before as a it was a ready fire aim investment. You know, something that because it's liquid, you can you can take a position and then evolve it as you go. That was in 2016. And then if you remember it all, you know, the whole Bitcoin and everything else started going up into 2017. And, um, and as that happened, I had to dig in and learn more um, because it was growing as a position and, and I needed to understand what we owned and what we should do with it. And, uh, and it became one of the things that, hit me was, um, and this was probably, you know, it'd be Q2 of 2017. It was that, um, well, this is a piece of software. This is free open source software. Um, and, um, and that's really critical. Who's developing it? Who's writing the code? What happens? Uh, what if something goes wrong? Where is it going? And a friend, a mutual friend, uh, organized a dinner uh, um, with me, John Newberry, and Matt Corallo, um, uh, both of whom are, um, well, John will have, is speaking in, 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 this, in, this, um, uh, in this event, uh, and, uh, uh, and Matt works, um, works at Square now and, and is, has been a key Bitcoin developer for a long time, along with John. And um, I remember at the time I was coming from a business environment and saying, well, so what's the product roadmap for Bitcoin? You know, tell me where, you know, I want to see the product roadmap. What are we going to, you know, where's Bitcoin, you know, how is it going to develop over what time frame? who's doing what, who's responsible? And they said, no, 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 John, you know, what I'm saying? that's not the way it works. You know, it's, it's, it's open source. It's, it, you know, everybody works on what they want to work on. Um, it's, it's even somewhat adversarial in terms of, of, of how, changes are made, we have to get consensus. And my initial reaction coming from a, again, a, a normal sort of business mindset was, what a mess, you know, this is, this is, um, this is not a way to uh, get something done quickly. But then in the summer of 17, and then uh, with all of sort of the, the last three quarters of 17, we got into the block size, uh, wars and the forks and, and everything else and we won't sort of rehash all of that there but it was a, a learning process for me to really understand not only how important development was um, but also the risks and and the how essential it is that bitcoin development is um you know is consensus based it's 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 hard to make changes to bitcoin that Bitcoin developers are free to pull in different directions, that um, there are multiple diverse uh, developers, multiple diverse funding sources. 
And, and you know, 17 was a pretty brutal time. Um, and come December, um, we'd just been through this really uh, uh, tumultuous year. And, um, and I was sitting there saying, my gosh, um, I really have to understand the development landscape better and the community uh, and make sure that it's, you know, that it's that if, to the extent I can contribute, we can make it contribute to being healthy and healthy. I had understood by then meant, again, diverse and diverse funding sources that didn't get in the way of the developers that didn't tell them what to do and so forth. And Adam back um, sent around an email um, suggesting the great scaling initiative. And basically, you know, we'd had this big war over block size and block size was being used very inefficiently. And there were known practices that just simply hadn't been implemented by some of the big users of block space um, and that needed to be implemented. He says, we ought to set up an initiative, get um, uh, uh, a couple of people to help educate um, some of the biggest users. And obviously we're talking here about exchanges and so forth on how to most optimally use block size, uh, block space. And I picked up on that, I said, well, that sounds like a really interesting. Remember, I was still learning about all of this and didn't really know where to support and how to do it. Um, and I said, well, that sounds really high impact and super important. So I forwarded the email. We, both Vincis Casitis and I were on this list, but I said, hey, Vincis, why don't, why don't you and I um, support this? You know, why don't we offer uh, to fund this? And he said, great. And so I answered back saying, well, Vince and I are going to fund this. Now what? And then it was crickets because someone had to step up and say, I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to lead this. And a couple of months went by and John Newberry stepped up and that was the origin of Bitcoin Optech. Um, and that was kind of how it all started. That was the process was I went through this discovery of, of, you know, coming in with a very different mindset of how it, in my mind, ought to work and really learning that no, in fact, um, this is a, it, it shouldn't work like I had in mind at the time, some kind of product roadmap and some kind of centralized top down thing. And on the contrary, we needed a diverse um, developer ecosystem with different funding sources and just set out to try to contribute to that. Well, I'm also a contributor to dev funding uh, at much lower scale than you are, but, but it's always felt like a voluntary tax for supporting the network. That's how I've always felt it is. A lot of people from the outside might be following these sessions, John, and not realize that their imperative exists throughout the Bitcoin ecosystem. Whether you're somebody who just holds a very small amount of Bitcoin or you're an exchange or you're an investor like yourself. But there is that imperative to support the network because you do have skin in the game owning Bitcoin. But you clearly have that imperative. You felt like you should support the network. But can you talk a little bit more about why this means other people should be considering it as well? Because there are risks of not having enough developers. Absolutely. Um, well, you know, if you care about Bitcoin, there are different reasons to care about Bitcoin. One is because you believe in the movement. Uh, another one is because you're, in, it's an investment. Or it could be both. Um, you, again, it it seems to me fairly obvious that actually the the heart of the 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 issue is is making sure this piece of software um uh is stable uh um, secure and and evolves you know in a, in a in a constructive way um i would argue it's kind of obvious that from a risk perspective it's obviously the biggest risk the biggest risk is inside you know the the thousands and thousands and thousands of lines of code um that are being maintained and 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 and, and updated and so forth um god forbid something goes wrong um, and you need a robust system to make sure that the way changes are made and so forth is, 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 well, again, extremely robust, um, and that Bitcoin moves forward, but in a very deliberate way, you know, and, and, and I think it's inherent to Bitcoin as a store of value, uh, it, it, it uh, protocol stability and, and, and a very deliberate development process is essential. But it seems to me that for all those reasons, it's obvious that if you care about Bitcoin, you, um, it's in your interest to contribute. And then the question is how you want to do it. And there's so many different ways. And, um, and in some regards, I think, you know, so, well, actually, I wouldn't even say in some regards, I think absolutely um, the diversity of opinions, the diversity of ways to do it, um, the diversity of sources 
adds as opposed to detracts. You know, the fact that even different supporters may have slightly different tax, um, um, that's healthy. Yeah, I mean, that's a really good point because one of the big newer contributors to raising funding for open source development on Bitcoin has been the Human Rights Foundation. And they right. specifically focus on issues relating to privacy. Big shout out to Alex Gladstein for everything he's done there. Um, when I first started to become aware of this was a couple of years ago, I went down to Chain Code Labs in New York and I interviewed John Newbury. Interestingly, I also met three of the residents there. One of them was Carla. I spoke to her again today for the first time, which was uh, amazing. She's now working at Lightning Network, working on LND. Uh, one of the interesting things, though, is since then, we now have Brink, which is based in the UK because Chain Code is New York. But we also have the HRF. We have all these different strands of projects. It isn't just core. It is the Lightning Network or it is privacy. And, and I think that's what you're talking about there, right? Absolutely. Um, by the way, I was remiss in not mentioning Chain Code earlier when I talked about Bitcoin Optech because John was working at, at, at Chain Code and, and they very kindly made him available. And Chain Code are the, you know, have been sort of the models for anyone who's supporting Bitcoin development for a long time. Um, the, uh, but you're absolutely right. I mean, the, in terms of really high impact, easy ways, I think those are some, you know, you know, Human Rights Foundation, um, and, and it's a charity. Anyone can contribute. Uh, Brink uh, as well. I mean, when I say a charity, it's, you know, it's a U.S. registered charity for the folks for whom that's relevant. You know, Brink is also U.S. registered charity. It's fairly straightforward. Um, you can understand what they're doing. There, there are a few other organizations. Um, there are other ways, like um, you can uh, you can directly sponsor developers. Um, we 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 do that in a couple of cases, both you know on an ongoing basis or grants. That takes a little bit more. You have to be reasonably plugged in in order to kind of know what where to go and how to how to do it. And and I obviously rely on the network um, that that I built up um, and. Um, yeah, I mean, I think the, the the more approaches, the better, and the different angles. You know, Human Rights Foundation on human rights, as you suggest, and private privacy, and and so forth. Um, um, Brink, adding a a, a non U.S. dimension, frankly, you know, to 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 an, a community that was a little U.S. heavy um, historically, et cetera. Yeah, I mean, wouldn't it be great if we had uh, a similar uh, organization to Brink in India, one in Australia, right. maybe one in. Uh, one in uh, Northern Europe, but if we could spread the uh, developer landscape, that's so much better for Bitcoin because we are trying to decentralize everything. We're trying to decentralize Absolutely. nodes. We're trying to decentralize mining. So if we can have some big investors come in and try and support a network such as Brink being built up in different locations, that's only going to be good for Bitcoin. Absolutely. And by the way, again, like, you know, like John Newberry's example, when he raised his hand to say, well, you know, I'll do Bitcoin Optech. There's um, we need we need more funding, but then we also need developers or 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 leaders um, uh, um, like Alex, like John, et cetera, to step up and 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 go and do something and then attract the funding to do it. It'd be wonderful if you, you know, if we saw that in, across, you know, in other geographies around the world, um, you know, I think. Um, uh, in fact, and often I, I think it's the someone step, stepping up and, and, and saying, I'll do it, um, is, 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 is maybe the, the scarce resource. I also think one of the other interesting things, just harping back to what I mentioned about meeting the residents at Chain Code, and then I've interviewed Amiti since, I've interviewed Carla again today. You know, when I met those, they were just, they were just enthusiasts who were interested in the Bitcoin network. It isn't that there is uh, a network flush with developers are appropriate. One of the important models is also the finding people who might be interested in Bitcoin and training them up. So that's a really good point. There's a whole bunch of things to say on that. First of all, it's important to remember why why do we need sort of philanthropic development of Bitcoin? Development? Because first of all, they're, they're incredibly talented group who's who have all kinds of great options. And they're and and frankly they're doing it because they're passionate about it. But they still, you know, not all of this, you know, some of them maybe bought some Bitcoin very early on. But 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 most of them or a lot of them, especially uh, newer ones and younger ones, uh, need to pay the rent. And 
and and are willing to sacrifice, um, but need obviously support to meet them halfway. And I think you're touching on something that's interesting about renewal. The um, you know there in a given year there are a few hundred developers who contribute uh, to Bitcoin in some in some concrete way. You know a few dozen, uh, say 30, 40, um, are in any given year are probably doing most of, of, of what is happening in that year, but that shifts over time. Uh, you know, there, there, there is, there is turnover, there is, um, an evolution and it's, and I think it's very healthy in that you have key developers who are, 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 are involved in the project for a number of years, but there's sort of steady renewal and, 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 and that's essential. Um, and also as part of decentralization is also that renewal, you know, if you don't, you don't want to necessarily have the same the same people forever um and uh one of the things that we did that we've that we've done in that regard well a couple things first of all again uh talk, john newberry at, at brink has been great about onboarding uh new developers into 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 bitcoin um we also uh um there's there's a a, a training program that jimmy song uh, did and uh, we funded uh, bursary scholarships uh, and, um, for uh, a few, you know, a couple of years ago uh, for female uh, developers to, to and and that led to uh, uh, to some great new newcomers to the to the system uh, and that's another thing you can support is 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 I mean Brink is one way good way to do it or these kinds of things to train up and recruit new developers to the system. Well, that, that's also important because one of the things I've learned, John, traveling the world with Bitcoin is that sometimes you can think of Bitcoin uh, essentially with the, the blinkers on based on the geography of where you live. Uh, me as an investor in the UK or perhaps a US investor thinks, thinks about Bitcoin in terms of the usage they would have. But I've traveled to many parts of South America. I've traveled out to Asia. And if you're in El Salvador, your use case for Bitcoin is going to be very different you're going to primarily be uh, using Bitcoin on the Lightning Network. You may have a different scenario for thinking about uh, your own security. You perhaps can't uh, create a multi-sig wallet and distribute keys into uh, different locations and safety deposit boxes. By having a diversity of developers, we also get to understand about the needs of people in different locations. Absolutely. Um, and, you know, Bitcoin... Is we're seeing, for example, what's happening in El Salvador and so forth, um, is I think is tremendously important for everyone, um, um, but important in different ways, um, in different parts of the world based on different needs. And uh, it's really important that the developer uh, community reflect that. I also think it's important to start thinking about the diversity of the backers. Um, I think for a long time, perhaps we relied primarily on uh, chain code or the work that was being done at blocks, but that's very US centric. Uh, I think we need a diversity of backers from across the ecosystem. Also, perhaps maybe one huge backer at some point would pull out and what, what would the impact be on funding? And the more decentralized that the funding that comes in for developers, the better. So we don't have any of those single points of failure for the money that's coming in to support the developers. Absolutely. No, I couldn't, I, I couldn't agree more, but we're seeing, I mean, it's such a different picture than it was in 2017. Um, we've made so much progress, um, but we need to, we need to keep it up. I mean, I guess that's my pitch to say, if anybody out there is holding a large amount of Bitcoin and they aren't supporting the network, it's time to get out there and, <clears throat> and write some checks and to support them, people. Uh, another thing that might be interesting with this session, just because of the title of the session, John, there might actually be developers or people who want to be developers who are thinking, you know what? I like this Bitcoin thing. I'd like to dedicate my time to it. Yeah, I can go to Google and earn $300,000 a year, but this feels like a better project for me to get involved in. And perhaps I can stack some stats while doing it. What would, you rec what would your recommendation be to developers who are thinking about, look, I want to get into this, but I don't know how to pay my bills. I don't know how to pay my rent with this because I don't understand how it works. Well, so I'm going to, I'll, I'll answer, and I suspect there, there, my answer will be incomplete, but I'll say, I'll give a few mm -hmm. ideas. One is 
it's a very welcoming community. The Bitcoin developer community is, is very welcoming. Um, it, is, it is internally demanding, right? Because it's defending um, an incredibly important monetary network um, and it holds itself and, and its community members to high standards, uh, thankfully, but it's incredibly welcoming. And so, you know, to begin with, just start interacting with the community of developers. Um, it's an open, you know, if you're constructive and 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 want to learn and are keen to be helpful, um, you'll find you'll find help in the community. Number one, number two, more concretely, you mentioned Chain Code Fellowships is a terrific um, on ramp. Brink is, is you know, and John Newbury, what he's doing there, I know you know is a terrific on ramp. And I'm sure there are others that I'm that I'm you know, and and of course once you once you're involved, you can then there's a there's a there's an ecosystem of grants and so forth that that you can plug into. But I, I'm sort of going before that in terms of how do you how do you learn, how do you get started, how do you figure out where to contribute, um, and uh, and sort of find your find your place. One other thing that I would say, you know, it one of the great ways to contribute. Uh, to Bitcoin that um, we, we always need more of is uh, review, code review. Um, uh, and, and, you know, it's, it's, it's less glamorous than, than having your own commit, but it's incredibly important. And that's a way that you can get started is trying to just be constructive and helpful in terms of um, reviewing code and making comments. Again, um, I think you'll find the developer community to be quite, quite welcoming. Well, code, code review is so important because we have a, a system here where we can't have any chargebacks. <laughs> if you make a mistake or there's an right. error, we all risk right. losing our money. So, I mean, it's probably one of the most important jobs in the in the ecosystem because bugs can be critical. So, okay, another area I'm going to ask you about. You've been quite close to the developers for quite some time and how they're funded. How have you seen that evolve over the last four to five years? Well... So as I said, we've got tons of new things. So we didn't like what. What did we not have? So I guess four or five years ago, as you pointed out, there was in terms of the major polls, there was chain code, block stream, and all those fantastic uh, MIT DCI, um, and um, um, you had obviously some ind independent developers. You had some developers employed um, by companies like Zappo, uh, Vincent's company, and so forth. Um, and that's continued, but now we have many more developers being funded by exchanges, um, and, you know, to work on Bitcoin, to work on what they want to do, um, whether, whether on the payroll or, or through grants. Um, but we also have human rights foundation. We have Brink, we have Bitcoin Optech, uh, different focuses, um, and, um, and, and others. I mean, I, 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 I there, there, I mean, I don't, it's not an exhaustive list that have sprung up. Um, and I think that combination of new organizations with just more grants going on from companies in, 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 in a lot of the grants and then the organizations are often very philanthropic um, is, is a lot better. And I think you put your finger on it. If I had to, there's so many different ways it could go. And frankly, part of the point is everybody should find their own way and, 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 and no one should dictate it. But if I personally had to say what what I love to see now develop would be more, you know, more brinks, more chain codes uh, and so forth in different geographies um, with different perspectives. Well, it's an interesting evolution, right? From an original group of uh, decentralized developers to some kind of structure around those to having essential charitable institution managing devs to onboarding people to now distributing those around but we've now there's even an imperative just to talk about it i mean if i make a show about funding developers it would be one of my lower performing shows because you know, people don't really want to hear about that they want to hear the moon talk but i even feel like i have an imperative not just to contribute myself but to even talk about it to have john newbury on the show i'm actually going to be doing a, a re what happened is when i uh, interviewed john at chainco did a 15 minute interview with Amiti, who you probably know, yes. uh, Carla and uh, and Fabian, the three of them for 15 minutes. 
they're all now working on Bitcoin development. So we're going to do a re reunion show and, and they're going to be talking about their experience. But I feel like us podcasters, the, the journalists, everybody in the space has a duty to cover this, to make it a topic that never leaves, that, that would never... T because, John, the real question is, how, what is, what is the maximum amount of funding we need for uh, developers? Wow. Gosh, that's a, you know, how long is a piece of string? That's a really good question. Exactly. Um, I think, interestingly, there is probably a balance. Bitcoin, you, I, I mean, in theory, so Bitcoin, you know, protocol, protocol stability is really important, right? I mean, sorry, I'm not, sorry. In, you know, I didn't mean that in that. Without a doubt, protocol stability is very important. And therefore, in theory, there is an upper bound to just how much change you want and how much time and therefore how many different um, inputs and, 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 and as a consequence, maybe somewhere how much funding. I don't think we're there. I mean, I, I think that we're still in a place on the curve where more... Um, more funding and more developers, especially more, you know, increasingly diversity developers, um, geographic and otherwise, would be um, would be would be beneficial. But there is an upper bound. I don't think it's interestingly. It doesn't take crazy numbers. You know, it's not like we need um, ten times more. Would be my guess. I mean, I don't. I, I think ten times more. I don't know. It could even be counterproductive. Um, it's not an order of magnitude of increase. But we need to maintain what we've got, and we could probably, I don't know, double it, triple it. But that's, um, that's interesting because without things getting out of control. Sorry, I, but that's interesting because I thought you'd say there's never an amount that's too much. But perhaps you're right. Well, and another thing I would just, yeah. I mean, another thing I would say is interesting, just as somebody who's made small donations myself, um, is that it's given me an imperative to learn more about developers and development and ultimately, therefore, increase my knowledge of Bitcoin. And I'm assuming it's done the same for you. That's well, for sure. I mean, I've learned so much through getting to know uh, developers and what they're working on, following their work. You know, I, I the whole point of it is I don't, you know, I have no influence on what they do, um, but I learn so much, and I and it gives me a chance also when I don't understand something, I I, I know who to call. I can I can say, you know, can you explain this to me? Why is this important? Um, what does it mean? Um, and, uh, and it's incredibly enriching, and it's just a fascinating. There's so many you know, Bitcoin is fascinating, um, and uh, hmm. the more you get into the detail, uh, actually, the more fascinating it gets. Yeah, I, I can agree. I can uh, agree more. Uh, yeah, the last five years of my life have just been the most incredible journey of learning, and I take a long time to learn these things. I also think it's quite funny after knowing you for three to four years. This is the first time I've actually interviewed you, John, which is uh, I know hilarious. We've been talking about it. I can't believe. I know, and here we are. Well, listen, look. Here we are. Finally. We're getting close to the end of the yeah, close to the end of the session. If you wanted to say one last thing to you know who've got skin in the game, they've got Bitcoin. They've never actually. Uh, supported the ecosystem of developers yet. You want to say one last thing to them and point them in a direction. Uh, let's do that now. Well, I would say, well, first of all, you know, just like um, getting off zero with Bitcoin is the first step, right? You know, the, you know that you know that zero owning zero Bitcoin is the wrong answer, um, and then it's a question of scaling. And similarly, I think if you if you care about Bitcoin, whatever your whatever your focus, um, development is key. You should. I think seriously consider making making a contribution. If you know how to code and you're passionate about it, maybe do it as a developer. Or if you you know how to code and you feel like you you want to organize something, go start up uh, a chain code or Brink India, etc. As you as, you know, as, as you suggested. If like me, um, you know, you 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 don't have any particular skills or talent, but um, you you have. Uh, the ability to provide funding, get started. And and I would, I think the easiest way to do it is is via the organized, you know, charities, some of the which we mentioned earlier. Um, and through that, you'll begin to learn and network, um, and 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 find your way around. And as you do that, uh, you know, I'm sure everyone will find her or his own way to focus and and who they want to support and so forth. Um, but that's probably the easiest thing to do out of the box. Cool.
Well, I'll finish off a little bit more dark. If you've got a big Bitcoin funds, especially if you're a company in the Bitcoin space and you're yes. not sponsoring developers, you really need to pull your finger out. If I'm giving more money than you, then that's an embarrassment. Pull your finger out, support developers. And I also think, look, check out Brink because they are newer. Check out uh, a Human Rights Foundation, Alex Gladstein, because they're also newer. They're doing some great work. John, always love seeing you. Hopefully I'll see you again in person this year and appreciate your time in this and also look just a massive thanks for everything you've done for bitcoin as well and, and the money in to support developers and appreciate you man and thank you for all you're doing and glad to see you back on your feet thanks brother cheers bye thanks everyone bye Hi, I'm Jonas from Chaincode Labs, the head of special projects, and I have the pleasure of speaking with folks across the ecosystem who are supporting open source Bitcoin developers and contributors. So uh, let me introduce you to some of our fellow, um, some of our panelists. Hong. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Hong. Uh, I am CEO of OpenCoin. Nice to meet And Beth. Hi, Beth Curtison here, uh, Managing Director at Gemini. And Connor. Hello, I'm Connor Okus, Product Manager at Square Crypto. Great. So we have a lot to get to in a short period of time. So let's start with Hong. And as the CEO of a global exchange, you have a ton on your plate. And yet, whenever I see you making an appearance, you're talking about the importance of Bitcoin developer funding. And um, so given your, pro your, your previous experience in traditional finance, and more specifically Goldman Sachs, I guess I'm wondering where you got that passion to support this ecosystem and, and support open, open source Bitcoin developers. Yeah. So um, for us, a Bitcoin investing in Bitcoin open source development is investing in the future of the industry. Uh, at OKCoin, we build the, we try to build the platform where people can come in and buy and, and sell crypto. But by the end of the day, Bitcoin is the first money of freedom that we have ever seen in our history of humanity. And for that money to be free, it is super important and critical to keep the code free, i.e. not free at no, uh, at no charge, but free at, as uh, you know, uh, open to everyone, right? Being transparent, encourage the free uh, uh, communication and uh, uh, exchanges of ideas, being transparent to everyone, being open to everyone for audit. So, you know, for us to be able to invest in that foundation of our industry is critical. We are a participant in the industry. We are benefiting from the growth of the industry. And we, we think that it's important investing in it and supporting the growth long term. Wonderful. And Connor, 
You were a recipient of a grant from Steve Lee and the team at Square Crypto not that long ago, and now you've been tasked to take the reins of that very same program. So could you describe what it was like going through that process a little bit, and also how you see the program remaining the same or possibly changing on your direction? Yeah, sure. So um, yeah, like you mentioned, I was a recipient of a Square Crypto grant. Um, so initially, I was kind of just volunteering um, in the Bitcoin space, uh, um, helping to organize a conference in London, um, volunteering to help like sort of educate newbies about Bitcoin. And I have a software engineering background. And so I've been working at kind of startups and, and large corporations, but I wanted to always kind of transition to working on, on Bitcoin full time. As you do, you kind of go down a rubber hole and you get very passionate and you kind of look for ways to work on Bitcoin full time. Um, and so the design, the Bitcoin design community came about and I kind of wanted to use my skills and the knowledge that I was building up over the last few years to just try and contribute as, as positively as I could. Um, and so the opportunity arose for, for me to kind of put a proposal forward on in terms of like what I would want to contribute to the space. And so I worked on a, a whole host of different projects from contributing to the Bitcoin design guide to um, contributing to a develop, developer library to help uh, make private key management easier, um, podcasting, um, an educational platform called Hello Bitcoin to help educate newbies. So like a whole host of, of different things. Um, and after the, the six month grant had finished, I was also given an opportunity to join the Square Crypto team full time, which um, was super exciting for me and like an amazing transition. So seeing what it's like to, to be a grantee who had never contributed to open source or Bitcoin specifically before to now kind of being on the other side and trying to look for talent and look for projects that are going to help move our ecosystem forward. And so in terms of what we currently do, we're kind of um, looking after around 25 designers and developers from 17 different countries. And that's something that we're super proud about and something we want to continue. But we also see the opportunity to fund projects and developers in perhaps underserved regions of the world and perhaps regions that we, we haven't quite paid as much attention to, as well as those opportunities to help fund projects that are trying to educate the next set of designers and developers and kind of help build a pipeline for the ecosystem going forward as well. Very nice. And Beth, um, I don't think people quite realize like how much you've seen in and around Bitcoin over the last few years. Um, could you give us a little bit of your Bitcoin history and then maybe you could describe what the Gemini Opportunity Fund is and why you took the job to lead it? Sure. Um, there's a lot of great content in uh, Ben Mesrick's Bitcoin Billionaires, but uh, and there's a lot we could talk about. But I, I joined Winklevoss Capital in February of 2013. Um, at that time, I think Bitcoin was worth $15 and I was uh, getting my blockchain.info wallet set up because it was the only um, wallet you know that you could use at the time or, or one of few options at the time. And um, this was pre-Gemini. So uh, today, fast forward 2021, we have 500 plus employees. Um, I joined Cameron and Tyler in the early days as their chief of staff through that hyper growth phase. Um, and recently they were on the podcast with Peter McCormick, where he inquired, hey, what's what's Gemini doing to support this ecosystem? And that was kind of the the birthing moment of Gemini Opportunity Fund, which has been a, a great opportunity for me to run at. Um, being that I worked so closely with Cameron and Tyler in those early days, I often get tapped for some of these special projects that don't uh, fall under one team or one division at the company. So. Uh, it's been a, a true pleasure to run at this, and we've now funded over $1.5 million worth of projects or developers um, directly. So it's a it's a donor advice fund um, where we donate uh, to nonprofits or directly to developers um, and grant specific projects as well. Great. And Hong, maybe you can tell us a little bit about the, the criteria or framework that you uh, use to choose which projects to support or which people support? Sure, yeah. So the way we think about our developer program, uh, the number one principle is that we want to make sure 
our development program is independent, i.e. whenever we provide that support to either individuals or protocol or project, uh, those support comes uh, with no strings attached. We want to make sure that, that any sponsorship out there has no corporate agenda attached. I think that is uh, the foremost important thing uh, when it comes to supporting Bitcoin developer. Um, in, internally, when we think about where to put our resources, uh, there are three key things that we are looking for uh, in terms of investment. Uh, number one is, uh, you know, we, we tend to like um, either projects or individual developers who contribute to the protocol, i.e. building privacy, contributing to security, uh, which we think are super important long term for developer uh, for a Bitcoin ecosystem. Uh, second thing that we would like to invest in uh, are adoption, promoting adoption of Bitcoin, uh, either in terms of you know specific projects like BTC Pay that we uh, supported for a year, uh, that's promoting the payment side of uh, uh, the, the, the system, or mobile uh, 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 adoption of Bitcoin, or Lightning, the second layer uh, building of, of, of within the ecosystem. And the last thing that we feel very passionate about, and we generally uh, uh, look for those uh, type of uh, characteristics uh, when picking our uh, sponsored um, recipients are uh, people, individuals, or projects who are contributing to the, uh, the building of the ecosystem, i.e. some of our sponsors are really uh, strong at uh, participating in PR which we think are a, a major bottleneck in the ecosystem. Uh, our mo one of our most recent, a recipient, Marco, is a core maintainer, um, So, which we also think that is super critical to the ecosystem, but is kind of under uh, undervalued to some extent. Uh, some of our uh, recipients are also very big um, advocate of mentorship, uh, i.e. building that mentorship and helping other developers who are up want to be developers to, to kind of really understand what's going on and learn how to be part of the ecosystem, uh, either in a more formal situation like Brink uh, or in a more informal situation uh, like what Amiti has been doing. So we, we feel very strong about those kind of uh, initiatives where people or individuals were uh, making contribution to those areas. So those two are, those three are generally the key things or areas that we try to prioritize our investments in. Obviously, you know, uh, um, uh, Square Crypto are doing a lot of great things that we would like to part uh, partner with them. Chain Code is also doing a lot of things that we have been learning a lot from you guys in screening those candidates. Uh, but mostly those three areas are what we're looking for. Yeah, and let me add that um, thankfully Chain Code isn't really in the grant business, so uh, we've we've offloaded all the hard work to you to you all. Um, Maybe uh, the same question to you, Beth. Uh, you've been you've been doing this a little not as long as, as maybe the other folks on the call. So, um, how have you sort of thought about the criteria and the frameworks that you use? Yeah, so we just launched in December um, of this past year. So we are definitely early on this process, and and so thankful for our first three devs that we've sponsored. Um, Amiti, Dhruv, and Harrell, who are working through the kinks with us as we as we build this out. Um, but really, we focus on three specific areas. So one is those sponsorships direct to the core developers. Um, secondly, we partner with foundations such as Brink, um, as Hong mentioned, and Human Rights Foundation. Um, all of those folks are doing such a great job of, of creating this ecosystem and continuing the development of the pipeline um, for additional developers to get on board and work on this. Um, so that we're, we're very grateful for that connection. And then also to specific grants. Uh, we recently sent a, a small grant, which hopefully you know made an impact to a few different developers working on a Mac mini project. So just making that small grant, it's it's a little non-traditional, but it, it helps go a long way so that these, you know, the funding can make it to these incredibly talented developers that are working on really interesting projects. So those are kind of the three um, funding mechanisms that, that we approach this. And uh, we really lean on the community. It's such an incredible community. 
an approachable community and um, Chain Code and, and you, Jonas, have been such a huge help for us as well. So um, that's kind of our, our approach. And um, if there's any projects or opportunities, folks can reach out to Opportunity Fund at Gemini. Dot com and uh, I work closely with Rich Smith on our security team at Gemini as well as my uh, dev counterparts to assess these projects and opportunities. Connor, uh, now that you're sort of on the other side of the table, how are you thinking about measuring the impact? Like how do you figure um, you know one project versus another project? Uh, just like what kind of long-term impact it might have? Yeah, so I think the nature of open source, work means everything is kind of transparent everything's in the open everything is verifiable and so we can kind of get a general sense of how a project's doing how a team's doing how an individual's doing by using tools such as github um, watching conversation tracking issues seeing what gets merged seeing where there's consensus on things seeing where there's maybe a bit of friction and kind of just understanding at a more general level um, but we also lean quite heavily on the communities as well and see like what, what are the communities' response to the grantees? Is there like a general consensus that this per person or this team is contributing um, positively to the project and the ecosystem as a whole? And I think uh, ultimately we want, we want the grantees to, to be happy and we want them to be excited to work in the space as well. So we'll very occasionally check in on them and and you know see if they need any additional support or if um things are going smoothly like what we can what we can do to kind of help them maintain that um some grantees are really good at kind of documenting their work in in some type of diary fashion whether it be like a weekly bi-weekly or monthly report type thing um that is by no means necessary if like someone was to take on a Square Crypto grant, but it, it is nice sometimes to have um, a more formalized way of, of kind of understanding um, someone's progress. Um, but I think it's like it's it's a it's a combination of all of those things that I've described um, to kind of get a, a nice overview of, of how projects go in and, and how it's sort of moving forward. Great. Um, I, I guess I have the question of giving grants is just not normal for a for-profit company. Um, and so maybe for, for Hong and Beth, like how do you, how do you get this through legal? Like how do you, how do you convince an organization that um, this is something that you can, you know, that, that is worth uh, doing and sort of how, how, do you, how do you actually make a company understand this? There is no legal process or any other internal I'm talking about what we, Happening through at OKCoin. I'm not trying to speak for Beth, and Beth will obviously have his, her perspective. Um, it's not something that we went through a process for uh, because there is no ROI that we're solving for here that it's related to a corporate agenda. We know that we need to do this, we want to do this. Um, and uh, the, the only thing that I think worried us a little bit upfront was how we make the uh, judgment call, where to allocate our money. And luckily we have Jonas, you and your team and the community and Square Crypto to help us with that. As long as we figure that out, you know, we feel pretty comfortable. And, and I think when we think about ROI, it's more about making sure that there are actually more than us, more than who has already been in the space to support it because we know it's important, it's critical. Uh, well, let me let me change the question a little bit for you then. How do you budget this? Oh, um, we we set aside some budget based on uh, you know our own revenue uh, and what we can afford to do on an annual basis. So right now we have uh, uh, we are allocating five hundred thousand a year to do that. Uh, maybe later on when we grow bigger, we can do more on an annual basis. But this is what we uh, currently have. Great. And Beth, you, you spun this up from scratch. What was that process like? And uh, how did you, again, justify this across the different verticals across the org? Yeah, well, I think to Hong's point, it, you know, it's she's obviously the CEO of, of OKCoin. And I think it makes a huge impact to have 
um, the founders or the CEOs or you know exec level um, really pushing for this, these efforts. So that's that's kind of how this came about at Gemini is it was founder founder led. Um, you know this was an important piece that Gemini felt the need to to show up and be a part of and support um, the ecosystem. So. Uh, and it, it seems it's the same way at, at Square Crypto. It's, it's um, you know, the CEO is leading the way as far as uh, what's important um, to them. So really, you know, we're just trying to support what's already happening in the community and just find a way to, to fund these projects and these people um, quickly and seamlessly. So that helps. Yeah, it helps to be CEO, I guess, and uh, or to have the CEO <laughs> support at least. Uh, <laughs> Connor, Square Crypto is a little bit different than I think uh, that otherwise exists in the ecosystem. And uh, while Hong and Beth are looking for folks to to fund externally, but Square Crypto has this internal team and somewhat of a partition team from Square itself. Could you tell us a little bit about that structure and um, maybe the, I mean, I think there's some obvious advantages there, but just sort of articulate sort of how it works. Yeah, sure. Um, so I think, yes, speaking of CEOs, uh, there's no secret that Jack Dorsey is a bigger uh, advocate of, of Bitcoin. And so around two years ago, um, felt the need to give back and contribute back to this this platform that we're all building on and uh, recruited a full time team um, to work on open source Bitcoin projects. Um, so the team is made up of uh, four developers, um, two, well, two, two, three product managers at this point. Um, the focus is, is ultimately just to improve the Bitcoin ecosystem and help to empower individuals economically. And yeah, and so it's just a way to give back to op the open source community. And it's very much aligned with a kind of Square's larger, um, uh, larger goals of being interested in more in a more accessible global financial system for all. And so the way we kind of help to improve the Bitcoin ecosystem is through our own work and the support in the work of others, um, which I mentioned previously through the grant program. So our, our own work inc includes building out the LDK, um, the Lightning Development Kit, um, which is a, a, a tool designed to help um, applications easily integrate Lightning um, we deem Lightning to be the preferred method of scaling for Bitcoin and how we're going to make it become uh, more accessible to everyone all over the planet and hopefully a, a global currency for everyone to use on a day-to-day -day basis. And so we have four developers primarily contributing to that. And then the other side is obviously the, the grant program um, where we fund different types of projects and, and individuals. Um, but we're, we're very much focused on mass adoption and Bitcoin becoming a global currency for all. But I'm sure there's, you know, there's institutions and there's companies that are going to be watching this where perhaps like a store of value proposition is more in line with their business interest. And so perhaps funding projects that are more focused on security, for example, might align more with what that institution is doing. Um, and so, regardless, it's just important to kind of to kind of get get involved, um, lean on the kind of companies that have have already found their mark in contributing in this way in the space, and um, and yeah, and ultimately just you know help improve and, and move the ecosystem forward as a as a community. Beth, has there been anything that's been really surprising from the last few months of? Um, spinning up this program and then getting to know the ecosystem. Yeah, I think um, you know from a from a positive perspective, the I mentioned this before, but the community has been so approachable um, and willing to to help out to put you in touch with with different devs or different projects that are going on. So that's been that's been really refreshing. I think. Um, because you don't necessarily see that in all industries or all all communities, so I've I've really really been uh, grateful for that. Um, I would say we definitely have some work to do when it comes to the administrative efforts of onboarding um, devs or projects or, or getting the funding to them as quickly as possible. Um, obviously, Bitcoin was was created um, to solve that specific problem. 
for the world. And uh, I think we have some some work to do there. Uh, but, you know, we're working through the kinks and, and I think we'll be in a better place soon. But, um, you know, the basics of, of sponsoring a dev, for example, um, there's some open sourced tools out there, but I think I think we can continue to open up the ecosystem and, and help um, other exchanges or other companies have kind of a, a blueprint of how to do this quickly and, and seamlessly to get more funding to these projects. And, and Hong, as a as a global leader for an exchange, um, what's sort of the most misunderstood aspect of supporting this free open source? Bitcoin development. I mean, do you get questions from other leaders who are interested? Like, how do how do how do you sort of speak with them about it? Yeah, I think uh, the two uh, takeaways that we've got um, over the last two years are number one, you know, when we support individual developers and projects, we also realize that those efforts are extremely hard to scale. Um, because you know, finding those uh, individuals and, and projects take time and take a lot of community input. At, and at the same time, the Bitcoin developer community also in itself has a lot of bottleneck that need uh, help uh, externally to, to, uh, to work through. Um, you know, for example, PR bottleneck and maintaining a work. Um, those are things that we hope that we can do a little bit more work. Uh, together with the community to figure out how we can actually help and, and make the overall supporting work more scalable. Um, and then the second thing that, that surprised us a little bit actually was a recent survey that we did with our customers, with our own customers about developer uh, uh, sponsorship. And it turns out that actually 80% of those who have been surveyed actually don't know how a Bitcoin developer is being supported. Uh, 30% thought that actually they were paid when Bitcoin transaction happens naturally. And then another 30% think that, that miners actually pay them, uh, which would be, would that be nice. But, uh, but once they realize that actually the Bitcoin developers uh, actually work on, on themselves and they need to find their own financial support uh, or just uh, allocate their time uh, part-time to this work. Then most of them, 80% of them actually are willing to, to participate in this in one way or the other. So I think that raising that uh, level of awareness in, the, uh, in, in general uh, would be quite helpful uh, to the ecosystem. So those two are kind of surprising to us over the last two, uh, two years' journey. And uh, Connor, I, I guess, um, how do we make sure that these this grant program and this kind of support remains decentralized? We don't want uh, people ask chain code all the time. When are we opening an office in X country or X continent? Um, it's not going to happen. But uh, sort of, how do you think about decentralizing the the funding and and support for these devs and and other contributors? Yeah, so I think companies and institutions just have to get involved. I think they all have you know a vested interest in seeing the success of of Bitcoin and. You know, the more you contribute, whether it be, be through funding or through development, design, whatever it might be, increases that probability probability of success. Um, and Bitcoin is something, you know, that's going to keep improving over time. And there, there isn't just sort of one way to, to contribute. You know, at Square Crypto, we have, you know, the, the, the grant program, Chain Code um, looks at a more educational approach. Um, the Human Rights Foundation and, Prink, and Brink take a slightly different approach as well. So if we can just continue on in that vein of, you know, having more and more organizations contributing in the way they see fit, leaning on current organizations that are already in the space. And if we can get to, I, I don't want to pull a number out here, but 25, 50, 100 organizations all contributing in different ways, um, to me, that feels like a, a good place to be in. So it's a kind of it's a long journey, but um, I think we we can get there, and and we're, and we're starting to see lots of different types of organization organizations um, show the enthusiasm to wanna to wanna contribute. So that's the main thing. So just 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 get involved is the kind of TLDR really. And in in that vein, and I think as the closing question, we'll go around the, the horn here. Beth, can you tell us maybe 
what you would suggest for an organization that's interested in getting involved? Yeah, I think um, to Connor's point, get just get involved, tap the network. Um, like I said earlier, everyone seems to be pretty approachable in this in this community. So reach out, you know, to the folks at, at Brink or at Chain Code. Maybe you can give them your email, Jonas, <laughs> and, and reach out and connect. You know, um, I, that's how I started. That's that's how I got educated. I'm still learning every day, um, and and I think it's a really really great group of people that that will help. Um, push you in the right direction wherever you need to go. Hong, same question to you. Uh, yeah, I would echo uh, the rest of the panelists. Um, you know, my DM is open too, and I've got a lot of support and help from you, Jonas, and the rest of the uh, community. So we are here to help. And and by the way, this this is the area where we actually see exchanges partner up. Uh, right, <laughs> we have we have partnered up with uh, other exchanges previously on. Uh, uh, on sponsoring and Amiti now you know, goes to Gemini too. So, you know, this is an area for everyone to really help uh, uh, grow, uh, help us grow long term because we really need to invest in the foundation, uh, invest in the fundamentals uh, of the industry uh, so that it's not a bubble by the end of the day. So, just, you know, just, just get into it. Connor, close us out. Yeah, I don't have much more to add, but. Um... I'd say, yeah, identify kind of where you'd want to contribute because there's so many different areas to, to contribute. Um, maybe that start there and identify what it is and what area you want to contribute to. And uh, like the, the panelists have said, like um, the people working in the Bitcoin ecosystem are ever so lovely and ever so friendly. And so uh, we'd, we'd love to kind of hear from you and um, help in any way we can really. Well, thank you all for your thoughts. And um, yeah, I, I think echoing the, the sentiments of, of, of everyone here, we'd love you to get involved. Uh, please do reach out. It shouldn't be too hard to, to track us down. So um, thank you all for joining. And um, I think that's it. Thank you. I cover Bitcoin and cryptocurrencies at ARK Invest, and I have the pleasure of introducing the call to action panel of the Supporting the Developer Ecosystem track. So in this track, we've laid out the developer landscape, we've explained why funding Bitcoin is a challenging task, and highlighted what individuals and organizations are doing to support the ecosystem. 
To wrap it up, we're going to hear from three initiatives actively supporting the developer ecosystem. We'll start with Mike Schmidt, co-founder and director of programs at Bitcoin Brink, a nonprofit organization that exists to strengthen the Bitcoin protocol by supporting and mentoring new contributors to open source Bitcoin development through its fellowship program and supporting the work of established Bitcoin protocol engineers through its grants program. We'll then move on to Neha Narula, director of the Digital Currency Initiative at MIT, who will explain the importance of funding Bitcoin security research and share a new initiative within MIT DCI designed to continue to harden the Bitcoin network and steward the industry's commitment to funding open source software. And then finally, we'll hear from Alex Gladstein, Chief Strategy Officer at the Human Rights Foundation, a nonpartisan nonprofit organization that promotes and protects human rights globally. Alex will discuss the Human Rights Foundation's Bitcoin Development Fund, which was launched in June of 2020, to support software developers who are making the Bitcoin network more private, decentralized, and resilient, so that it can better serve as a financial tool for human rights activists, civil society organizations, and journalists around the world. Thank you, Yassine. Thank you, Art, Square, and Paradigm for putting this event together and giving developer funding the attention that we think it deserves. My name is Mike Schmidt. I'm co-founder at Brink. Brink is a not-for-profit we formed in 2020, and our explicit goal is to support the Bitcoin developer community through funding, education, and mentoring. We have two different programs. We have a traditional grant style program where we fund existing Bitcoin developers. And we also have a more novel fellowship program that is a one year in-person training program to onboard new Bitcoin developers. Um, as, as everybody knows, Bitcoin development is notoriously difficult and development talent is scarce. And so this fellowship program we think will help onboard new promising developers to the projects. So why Brink? Well, we're a 501c3 organization, which means all donations to Brink are tax deductible. And due to some generous sponsorship provided by our founding sponsors, 100% of the donations go to our grantees and fellows. And all of our administrative and upfront and administrative costs are taken care of. We're funded entirely from individuals and organizations that are looking to support the ecosystem. The service that we provide our partners and our sponsors are turnkey in that Brink finds vets and mentors developers. We also handle all the administration, the legal, the visa and other requirements for donations um, and also any sort of travel logistics or travel related expenses in getting fellows to our office in London. And we're exclusively focused on the Bitcoin and Lightning ecosystems. We have a strong track record in terms of individuals on our team. We have hands-on Bitcoin core development experience in-house. And we also have years of mentorship, training, workshop, and educational resources, specifically in the Bitcoin space. A little bit more about our team and our backgrounds. So my co-founder, John Newberry, he's a core contributor since 2016. He also co-founded Bitcoin Optech, which is a, an educational resource for developers and folks in the ecosystem. He started the chain, or he worked on the chain code residency. He founded the Bitcoin Devs Meetup in New York, and he's also the PR Review Club organizer. Myself, I'm a contributor to the Optech newsletter, and I also organize and present at various workshops and events in the ecosystem. Anthony Hodge has worked since 2014 at cryptocurrency nonprofits, and she heads up our operations efforts. And on the board, we have Dave Harding. Dave's a prolific Bitcoin technical writer and educator. He co-wrote the Bitcoin.org developer documentation back in 2014 and 2015. And he's also the principal author of the Bitcoin Optech newsletter. Jerry Brito is executive director of Coin Center, and he's testified several times in Congress, and he's been published in the Harvard Journal of Law and Public Policy, Stanford Technology Law Review, as well as Wall Street Journal and the New York Times. And Carla is a software engineer at Lightning Labs, and she works on the LND Lightning Network implementation and also associated infrastructure projects. She was a resident at the Chaincode 2019 residency 
and she brings lightning expertise to our board. So along with myself and John, Dave, Jerry, and Carla make up the Brink board. So with our strong team that we've put together, um, also a stellar grants program. Our grants program is targeted to be long-term. Long-term grants are more sustainable for the developer versus piecemeal sporadic donations that happen maybe online, you know, can fund a developer for a month and then they don't know where their funding is at for the next month. So we're targeting those long-term grants to allow the grantees to really focus on Bitcoin and related development work full-time. They're also independent grants in that a developer can work on whatever they choose to work on with, within their expertise and they're not being told what to do or necessarily how to do it by Brink. As mentioned previously, we have a strong technical and experienced grant committee that's made up of the, of the same board members that I mentioned previously. And so we're vetting the best and most impactful projects and developers in the space that will have the biggest contribution. We funded Jesse, who is an ex Coinbase alum, and he's working on key management. Alicos is working on Bitcoin Development Kit, which is a kit for wallets to more easily implement Bitcoin into their wallet software. Habasto is one of the most prolific Bitcoin core developers. He has a ton of Bitcoin core and Bitcoin GUI commits. And we've also just recently announced Larry and Sebastian as our second round of grantees and they're focused on code review and testing. For more promising um, but less experienced developers, we have the fellowship program. And that fellowship program is a year long focus on Bitcoin development and it's on site in our office in London and mentored by my co-founder and longtime Bitcoin developer, John Newberry. And it builds on his experience organizing the chain code residencies and also mentoring new contributors over the years and running the PR review club. And there's a few different organizations that are doing traditional grants um, but we really think that this fellowship is completely unique to the industry and furthers um, onboarding new talent to the ecosystem. Right now we have Gloria Zhao, who's actually in London and has been there for a couple months, already contributing very valuable work under her package relay efforts. And we've just now have a second fellow whose contract is just recently signed and we have not yet announced and this person hasn't started yet, but we're excited to announce soon. None of this fellowship work or grant work would be possible without contributions from our founding sponsors, entrepreneur Wences Casares and investor John Pfeffer, who contribute, contributed initial funds to get us off the ground and fund us for the first few years in terms of our operational and legal expenses and upfront expenses. So we thank them because it's their faith in us, but more importantly, their belief in the value of investing in developers that got us where we are today. And so where are we today? Where is Brink today? Well, Brink has $3 million pledged in just over nine months of operation. And as we've seen, we've already funded five grantees and two fellows. And while we're all very happy about that and the money that we've received, we think we're just getting started. So who's contributing so far? Well, we're happy to have some of the biggest companies in the industry contributing to our mission and donating for our grants and our fellowship programs. In addition to these names that you see on the screen, we also have donations from smaller organizations and individuals who have donated as well. So if you're interested in what we're working on and what we're trying to achieve here, feel free to subscribe to our Brink email newsletter where we talk about what our fellows are working on, what our grantees are working on. We announce new rounds of grants, recipients and fellow recipients and keep everybody updated with the development ecosystem. Likewise, you can follow Bitcoin Brink on Twitter where we have similar updates. Feel free to reach out, donate at brink.dev to chat about how we can partner together to further the development ecosystem and fund additional projects and developers in the space. We also accept online donations on our website, brink.dev. And because we're a 501c3 organization, we are also eligible to be listed under donor advised funds. And so if you don't see Brink listed under your donor advised fund, feel free to reach out and we can discuss that as well. 
Thank you for your time and consideration, and we hope to hear from you. Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Neha Narula, and I am the director of the Digital Currency Initiative, which is based out of the MIT Media Lab. So what is the Digital Currency Initiative? We engage in Bitcoin and digital currency research and development. We're housed at MIT, and we primarily focus on unsolved challenges in security, scalability, and privacy. So I want to talk about digital currency and where we are for a second. It's not done. We're not done building Bitcoin. There's still a tremendous amount of work to do, and there's still really fundamental challenges that we need to solve in order to do that work. And part of what we do at the DCI is engage in the deep research to get that done. So why MIT DCI? There's so many organizations you're going to hear about that support Bitcoin and Bitcoin development. Well, we're really here to address some of the fundamental digital currency challenges by conducting long-term research. We have been around since 2015, and we have been supporting senior Bitcoin developers since then. So we are a neutral long-term home for senior developers. And we're also in a unique position to leverage the MIT ecosystem of experts in economics, security, distributed systems, cryptography, and more. Our mission is to empower individuals by making it as fast and easy to move value across the world as it is to move information. And surprisingly, that does not mean we just work on Bitcoin. Uh, so in 2015 and 2016, we hired three important core maintainers and developers, including the lead maintainer. Uh, and MIT became the first university to employ core developers and to really uh, put its stamp on Bitcoin as a research-worthy, important protocol. Uh, in addition to that, we started doing some work on central bank digital currency research in 2016. Uh, in the intervening years, we have worked on really important projects like bringing smart contracts to Bitcoin, uh, disclosing vulnerabilities, publishing ideas that can help scale running Bitcoin nodes, uh, implementing really important monitoring to make sure that the Bitcoin system is running the way that it's supposed to be running. But in addition to that, we are in a unique position to talk to uh, governments and lawmakers and uh, other folks in the public sector to help explain the technology and work with them to understand digital currency better. And what we're doing this year is we're actually launching something completely new, which is focused entirely on Bitcoin security. So let me tell you a little bit about why we're focusing on Bitcoin security. So Bitcoin, like I said, is not done. Uh, it has some really unique properties that make solving challenges in Bitcoin uh, you know, pretty hard. So first of all, it's 24-7 global access for any, everyone. Anyone can join the network. Anyone can start mining. Anyone can go and look at the code, which is posted online. There's no undo or rollback. There's no system administrator or master key holder. So if something goes wrong, there's nobody who can go get your coins for you. That's, that's just a done deal. This is decentralized open source software. That means that there isn't really a leader or a manager. There isn't a roadmap that the developers are necessarily following. This is all done in a decentralized manner. And then to add to that, attacks are easily monetizable. So attackers can almost anonymously make off with a lot of value in certain situations. So when you put all four of these things together, you are in an incredible incredibly challenging adversarial environment. And that's the environment that developers are working in. And that's the environment where we need to address issues like privacy, security, and scalability. And what we're seeing now is that Bitcoin is entering a new era, an entirely new era. It recently surpassed a trillion dollar market cap before coming back down. There's a very big upcoming shift that's going to happen in a few months and years, which is going to be a big change in the network security and economics around Bitcoin. That's the transition from block rewards to transaction fees as the primary way of rewarding miners. In addition to that, we have a very passionate group of volunteer developers and distributed organizations which fund full-time developers, and we have a really healthy grants ecosystem, which is fantastic. But I would argue that that's not going to get us where we need to go. We really need to think about implementing 
long-term processes and long-term thinking and long-term homes. It uh, almost requires the amount of time it takes to get a PhD, to get really up to speed in Bitcoin. There are very few people around the world who are able to, uh, to, to do solid code review and to really understand all the intricacies of the network. And we need to think about putting processes in place to continue to build that capacity and create more of these people and make sure that they have a home. So that's why we are starting this security initiative. Uh, we have the following goals. First of all, we want to maintain a uh, long-term senior team. So we're trying to build out a senior team of developers and research scientists and provide a long-term home for these people. In addition to that, we want to focus on work that is really going to find and prevent layer one bugs. So things like removing risky code dependencies and researching safer programming languages. We want to investigate, monitor, and deter. So that involves things like conducting code audits and researching the long-term economic security of Bitcoin. And finally, we need to improve automation. We need to decrease reliance on scarce experts and also identify and circulate best practices. So these four things are a big part of the security initiative that we are launching at MIT. We already have a lot of really great um, contributors, but we are looking for more. So this is an excellent opportunity if you want to make an investment in the long term success of Bitcoin. Our goal here is to help bring Bitcoin's global security infrastructure up to a par up to par with a system that is actually capable of guarding a trillion dollar market no matter what is thrown at it. So I want to tell you a little bit about some of the folks that we have at DCI. Uh, in addition to myself, we also have um, Vladimir Vanderlaan, who is a Bitcoin core developer and has been the lead maintainer for over five years. Taj Dreija, who's a research scientist. He's a co-inventor of the main scaling solution for Bitcoin, the Lightning Network, and is uh, doing a lot of really important work bringing smart contracts on top of Bitcoin. Corey Fields, another longtime Bitcoin core developer, his expertise is in the build systems and peer-to-peer -peer networks and security. And Madaris Virza, he's a research scientist with a PhD in cryptography from MIT. Uh, he's a co-author of the Zero Cash paper, which was the predecessor to Zcash, the cryptocurrency, and has done a ton of work in zero knowledge proofs. So that's the current DCI technical team. We're looking to expand this team to build out the security initiative. But being at MIT, it's not just technical leaders. We also have an amazing group of advisors drawing on the MIT ecosystem. So that includes uh, folks from Sloan, like Simon Johnson, former chief economist of the IMF, Rob Townsend, an economist, uh, Ron Rivest, who invented a lot of the really important cryptography that we're using in these systems today, and Deb Roy, who does work in decentralized networks and is a leader at the Media Lab. Uh, we were really lucky to have some core important people in the ecosystem as part of our advisory board while they were at MIT as well. That includes the current chairman of the Securities and Exchange Commission, Gary Gensler. We we're sorry to lose him, but he's a former advisor at DCI. And Christian Catalini, who is one of the co-creators of Facebook's DM. So those are former advisors at DCI. We're really lucky to be in a place as vibrant and exciting at MIT, where we get to work on Bitcoin and bring students and faculty and researchers into our world, help them, share with them some of the really fundamental problems that we're going to need to solve um, in order to bring Bitcoin to the next level. If you are interested in supporting our work, here's how you can get involved. You can go to our website, dci.mit.edu, which will show you how to donate and become a part of our network. You can send us an email at dci at media.mit.edu. We host regular roundtables on Bitcoin security where we get bring developers together with investors to share insights about what is happening inside the Bitcoin network and where things are going. Um, so we would love for you to be a part of that as well. So thank you very much. Hey everyone, my name is Alex Gladstein. I'm the Chief Strategy Officer of the Human Rights Foundation. Very happy to be with you today and want to take a moment to talk a little bit about our Bitcoin Development Fund and how we can help push for more open source uh, development and creativity and innovation in the Bitcoin space. 
the Human Rights Foundation is, is a nonprofit based in New York City, founded in 2005. Our goal is to promote civil liberties and political rights around the world, especially for people who live under authoritarian regimes. Uh, today, about 4.3 billion people across 95 countries uh, live under different kinds of authoritarian regimes where they don't have the same rights and privileges that we may have in, in a country like America. And at HRF, our programs range from uh, legal defense and advocacy for political prisoners to conferences like the Oslo Freedom Forum that, that bring dissidents and journalists and activists together uh, with people from different industries to make a bigger dent uh, in, in the fight for freedom, uh, to technology programs like Flash Drives for Freedom, which actually help outside information get into closed societies uh, like North Korea, where people don't have access to the internet. Uh, we're led by a board of esteemed uh, international human rights advocates like Gary Kasparov and uh, former political prisoners from many countries. And our work uh, has an impact annually of reaching uh, m many, many millions of people around the world. Now, um, we, we, we do this in, in a couple different ways. Uh, you know, first of all, we, we have this idea of, you know, partnering directly with activists on the ground so that we're, we're basically supporting innovators who kind of, indigenously know what they're doing. You know, we're not coming in with like a big outside idea. We're listening to what they have to say and we're trying to support them in, you know, in that particular way. And we give them the stage, we give them uh, grants. Um, you know, we, we seek to figure out what, 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 it, what works best in different places and, and then support that from, from however we can. Uh, and we've always had um, a strategy of relying on technology to do so, uh, whether it be training activists on how to stay safe online, uh, or uh, as we will we'll get into, uh, learning about the power uh, of Bitcoin. The important thing to understand is that Bitcoin is very closely tied to human rights. Uh, hundreds of millions of people around the world suffer from closed bank accounts, devaluation, demonetization, uh, censored payments, financial isolation, broken infrastructure. They don't have a lot of the fintech that we have. They don't have a lot of the rights and abilities that we have, and, and it's often hard for them to actually store their value and time and money in, in, in a money that's going to preserve uh, value, uh, you know, whether it's over time or space. Um, these things are not really accessible to many, many people. So Bitcoin's a game changer. You know, it is, as, as you've probably been learning, this open network that allows anyone to connect, that provides bridges and not walls, uh, and, and that allows for the instant transfer of value in a totally parallel way to the existing legacy system. And this is this is just so important for like the billions of people who live under authoritarian regimes, uh, or for the 1.2 billion people who who live under uh, double or triple dish, digit inflationary environments. Um, and you know, at the end of the day, Bitcoin is this just like remarkable empowerment tool. So the question is, how do we activate that? Right. Um, well, we've chosen to focus on three areas at the Human Rights Foundation. Uh, first of all, public education. So we do a lot of talks like these. Um, we do a lot of writing, we do a lot of podcasts, uh, we do a lot of uh, presentations at conferences. We try to really get the word out about, uh, you know, that this sort of um, the human rights implication of Bitcoin. Uh, the second thing we do are trainings. So we will actually run, whether they be virtual or in person, uh, workshops and academies to help activists learn about Bitcoin if they wish. Of course, it's a voluntary system, but uh, if they need it. We want them to understand how to use this tool because it can be very powerful. And the third thing that we do is most relevant to us today, and that's support uh, the open source Bitcoin uh, ecosystem. Uh, and that we do that through the Bitcoin Development Fund, which we launched about uh, a year ago in uh, June of 2020, uh, ma mainly to like do what we can from our side to contribute to Bitcoin to make it a better tool for human rights activists. I mean, that is our primary goal. We want to make this thing more usable, more private, more decentralized, more accessible. Um, we've given out a bunch of grants so far, totaling, uh, you know, north of $750,000 over the last year. Uh, some of the recipients are working on, uh, Bitcoin core, like Gloria Zhao, for example, some of them are working on new privacy implementations like Chris Belcher. Uh, some of them are working on the lightning network, maybe someone like Fode Diop. Um, some of them are doing translation into different languages like Arabic Hoddle. Uh, some of them are even just doing general education about the space like Janine um, or contributing from different places around the world, uh, like Calvin, who's, uh, you know, a, a Bitcoin core contributor from Korea. Uh, if we look at other examples, we're supporting also teams. Uh, the Spectre team is making multi-sig a lot easier for a lot of people. 
Sphinx is empowering people to communicate on a social media platform that's powered by Lightning. Um, and the Moon Wallet is a remarkable open source, uh, non-KYC, sort of non-custodial wallet built by a Ar- team in Argentina that we're very, very happy to support. Uh, we've also s- done some internships uh, with Blockchain Commons so that uh, you know college students can contribute to Bitcoin and actually help onboard activists, which we think is quite exciting. And again, just with our just global focus and our background, we feel like we want to give back, especially to societies that uh, that are facing a, a struggle right now when it comes to civil and political rights. So we're we're delighted to to support core developers like Abu Bakar in in Nigeria and and Dhruv, uh, who, who's from India. Um, our future plans are to continue doing this uh, probably this year with a heavy focus on uh, UX and on Lightning. I mean, we really believe that the Lightning Network is really going to be a game changer for people living under authoritarian societies worldwide or in difficult currency situations. A lot of folks need to make small payments. I mean, they need to make a $5 payment, a $10 payment. So in the future, that just won't really be that feasible on chain. So it's very important that we have easy onboarding into Lightning, uh, that we have best practices when it comes to privacy, uh, protecting our identities. These things are all much more important for people living under authoritarian regimes, obviously. So you can follow our work at hrf.org slash dev fund. Um, and the other big thing that we're, we're doing that's coming up is, is, is along the lines of the training that I spoke about, the education, the connections. So at the Oslo Freedom Forum, our annual event, this will take place in Miami on October 4th and 5th. Uh, we're going to have a full day in a theater, kind of TED, st- TED Talk style. We're also going to have a whole interactive day with actually a full scale kind of Bitcoin Academy, which is going to be a place where activists and journalists and philanthropists and technologists can learn more, more about Bitcoin from, from world experts. And we're going to go through a whole day of thinking about what is Bitcoin? Why is it important? How do I use it? We're going to have a faucet. We're going to help people get involved. We're going to talk about lightning, multi-sig. We're going to talk about how to spend your Bitcoin on services like BitRefill or, or Paxful. We're going to talk about receiving donations and remittances through things like BTC Pay Server uh, or Strike. We're going to, we're going to talk about, uh, who controls Bitcoin and how does it how how does it work in that sense uh, from a political angle? That's always very interesting to activists. We're going to talk about the political um, backstory of the cypherpunks uh, and, and and Satoshi, and you know we're going to explore the political nature of Bitcoin. Um, we're gonna we're gonna look into Bitcoin mining and and try to help explain why it's actually quite important uh, and critical for the Bitcoin system. And we're also going to talk about building communities. We're going to have folks from from Bitcoin Beach come and talk about what they did down there in El Salvador, which is obviously so so world changing. So we're excited. Um, these are some of the educators and stakeholders and developers that are gonna join us, uh, some of the teams that'll be down there. I think it's gonna be a great program. So you can learn more at oslofreedomforum.com uh, and, and to apply to join us today. Um, thanks very much. I appreciate your time. We are excited to contribute to Bitcoin from the human rights angle. We realize we're probably the first human rights group to do this. We want to see a lot more human rights groups get involved uh, because ultimately that's what this thing is. It's it's a powerful tool uh, for human rights. And thanks again.